His real first name is actually David, but upon graduating Harvard in 1837, he changed his name to Henry. He was fluent in several languages. He dreamed of being a successful writer, but was spurned by the publishers of his day. Settling in his hometown of Concord, he started his own school, which failed soon after opening. His hero was his older brother, John, who died soon after the school failed. His passing devastated Henry, so he returned to work in his family's pencil factory. Falling in love with his late brother's girlfriend, Henry proposed to Ellen Sewell, who turned him down. The saddened and depressed Henry retreated to the beloved woods that gave him so much comfort. While cooking fish over a small campfire, he accidentally started a forest fire and burned down a hundred acres of woods near Concord. Humiliated and angry, he went to work as a caretaker and tutor for the children of his friend, the great writer Ralph Waldo Emerson. After failing to pay his taxes, the city officials put him in jail. After his release and with Emerson's help, the 28-year-old failed writer Henry David Thoreau escaped society by building a small cabin deep in Walden Woods to write a book in tribute to his brother John. Hi, I'm Michael Jonathan, folk singer, tree hugger. I wrote the Walden play. I wrote it because I wanted my kids to meet a hero of mine, Henry David Thoreau. The setting is 1847, it's September. Henry just spent the last two years, two months, and two days of his life in a little cabin that he built. It was on a piece of property that Ralph Waldo Emerson had loaned for his use so he could have this great experiment, leaving society, leaving the world around him to write, to really contemplate nature, and to take life down to its very barest of essentials, as he put it. In an age of oil wars and global warming concerns, hybrid cars, biofuels, what Thoreau wrote is so vital for our day. It's just that people have heard his name, they've maybe heard a quote or two, they don't really know anything about the man. So this is a play about his life, this is a play about his spirit and what he wrote. We're gonna begin our journey though with some facts about Thoreau and his life. First thing we wanna do is visit the actual replica of the actual cabin that he lived in for those two years. It's right over this hill, so just follow along with me. It's kinda of cool to check out. It's a beautiful autumn day. We're at Walden Pond, not too far out of Boston, Massachusetts. It's a real place. It's a real pond. This is a replica of the little cabin that Henry David Thoreau spent two years, two months, and two days of his life in the late 1840s. It's a solid little thing, nothing really special. It's not very big. But during that short amount of time, Henry David Thoreau wrote in his journals almost daily. He played his flute almost daily. He absorbed the beauty of nature and the woods that surrounded him. And in that short amount of time, Henry David Thoreau changed literary history with his book Walden and became the environmental forefather of the great green movement that we're experiencing worldwide today. It's a half mile walk from the replica of the cabin to the actual cabin site here in Walden Woods. We're just a little ways from the pond. This part of the woods was very special to Emerson especially. He was very concerned about the encroachment of the cities and the, the growing territories of houses and factories. And so Emerson took it upon himself to actually start buying up plots of land along Walden Pond to protect the woods. After a while, Henry had the idea that he wanted to get away from the society that he was having trouble with dealing with. And uh, it was Emerson that said that he could build his little cabin on the shores of Walden Pond on Emerson's property. This is the actual site that Henry built his cabin. And it's a beautiful section of the woods. Back here, he took soil from the hillside and brought it forward by hand and created a nice level platform for his cabin. It's a reverent site. It's a very 
peaceful and beautiful place, and you can see why Henry wanted to move out here and, and do his writing. What we did for the sake of this documentary is we invited probably one of the most uh, respected Thoreau scholars in North America. His name is Tom Blanding, and he doesn't live all that far from Walden <laughs> Pond, do you? No, no, I'm just a few miles down the road. We pronounce his name Thoreau. Thoreau, not, like not, a Thoreau job. We live in an age of concerns about global warming and oil wars and hybrid cars and biofuels. Thoreau really saw this coming. He may not have envisioned it as we see it today, but he saw the value of nature and its decimation as something serious. Yes, he was a prophet without honor in his own country uh, because his reputation, it took several generations for his reputation to uh, develop after his death. He was so far ahead of his time. So he, he was not recognized as a successful writer while he was alive? No, uh, his first book, A Week on the Conquered of Merrimack, the publisher returned the bulk of that edition of 1,000 copies to Thoreau, unsold. It didn't sell. Yeah, yeah it been published at his own expense. And, and, he spent, and Wal Walden was not a big seller. No, it wasn't a big seller either, but that first book, he, he took all those unsold copies and piled them up in his, uh, attic study in his parents' home, and at the end of the day, he sat down to his journal and said, I now have a library of nearly 900 volumes, over 700 of which I wrote myself. <laughs> <laughs> so if, uh, if uh, Henry David Thoreau was a TV star, he'd have been canceled. Oh, Maybe definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Henry lived while Mark Twain navigated the waters of the Mississippi. He died as Vincent van Gogh began painting in Europe. I wrote the Walden play as a way to introduce Thoreau to a new generation. The play was posted on our website. Any community theater, high school, or college could download the script simply by registering the performance. In just 24 months, over 7,200 performances were registered by schools and theaters in 37 countries. In the play, the dialogue between Thoreau and Emerson are actual quotes taken from their literary works. You'll hear a reference made to musician Don Henley of the rock group The Eagles. He helped Tom Blanding and others save Walden Pond from developers in the 1990s. So let's journey to the historic opera house in my hometown of Lexington, Kentucky, and join Henry David Thoreau during the final two days he spent in his cabin before leaving Walden Pond. such beauty. To be awake is to be alive. There. That's better. All creation awakes in the morning. Music and art are born at sunrise. Hmm, I must write that down. Even better, I'll play my flute. When I hear music, I fear no danger. I am invulnerable, like the morning sun. Ah, yes, the day is perpetual morning. I hunger for companionship. I'll make some garden snap beans.
Like my woodpile. <laughs> Peas and beans keep me company. <laughs> it is a communing and conversation with nature. I must write that down. <laughs> Like my woodpile, peas keep me company. Oh, dear God, you're having conversations with peas and finding it intellectual. Henry, my good friend. Mr. Emerson, my teacher and brother. Still talking to your vegetables, Henry? <laughs> I am finding a place with the trees, the woods, even snap beans. We are all connected to the pulsing heartbeat of nature. So you're talking to your peas again. Well, I've brought you a basket of sweet corn from my wife's garden. Maybe you can have a group meeting. <laughs> my boy, you need a lady friend. Nonsense. I find the solitude of this cabin stimulating. Well, why not venture into town and meet a good woman? Let her snap your peas. My log pile is like my woman. How is that possible? Like a woman, it keeps me warm at night, cooks my meals, even engages in conversation as it crackles in the evening. Look, every man gazes upon his wood pile with affection. I love to stack mine before my window. The fireplace lets the world know that I have company like a cheerful housekeeper. The chimney lets the world know that me and my wood fire live here. I have a younger cousin, you know. You'd like her. I'm not crazy. Oh, of course not. <laughs> and how long have you lived alone out here now? A year and a half? Two years, two months, and one day. Two years all alone in these woods, living in your little $28 cabin, enjoying nature, communing with the woods, talking to your vegetables. <laughs> you need the embrace of a good woman. <laughs> Now, there's an attractive oak. Perhaps you could go hug that tree. <laughs> Make fun if you must. Have a good laugh if it brings you fulfillment. There is a spiritual and intellectual reason for my time in these woods. I apologize, old friend. I am supportive of you, truly, but I do find your life here odd and somewhat amusing. There is nothing odd about it. Oh, you hug trees and converse with vegetables. Seems completely sane and normal to me. <laughs> See, I have been writing. I have carefully recorded all my thoughts and musings, every morsel of emotion and reason between my spirit and this small, brilliant patchwork of earth. <laughs> In a world full of mountains, trees, ponds, and peas, this is surely what society needs, a book about mountains, trees, ponds, and peas. You sound like my father. <laughs> does he still look for you at the pencil shop? He does. And does he provide you with these pencils? It's a fine and practical writing instrument. The finest. You realize your family cuts down trees to make these pencils. Mr. Emerson, is the purpose of your visit simply to mock me? Oh, don't be so sensitive. I'm one of the few who still care enough to check on you from time to time. Well, I do appreciate your concern. Hopefully as a friend who will take me for what I am. Henry, you have such intelligence and skill and passion. But as much as you love this earth, I am afraid you are going to pass from it unremembered. All you do is write about dirt and ponds. I have also written about society and man's attitudes and destruction of himself. Yes, but it's not poetry. It's, it's not a story. It's not a novel. Well, it's barely an essay of social relevance. Every artist dips his brush into his soul and paints his own nature into the canvas. I write the truth. And will this truth provide employment? Will it buy a home and sustain you? Will it bring you honor? Mr. Emerson, rather than fame, honor, or money, give me truth. Here is your truth, dear Henry. At this rate, you will have achieved more recognition for helping your father market his lead pencil than for a single word you've written with it. Then so be it. I cannot be convinced that I am irrelevant. If that is to be the legacy of my work, then so be it. You surrender to your fate too quickly. I fear that you have wallowed in your loneliness amongst these bushes for far too long. To the contrary, I have found strength in my loneliness. 
I understand the meaning of quiet and solitude. My isolation keeps me company. My friend, hear me. You are conversing with vegetables in trees instead of women. You make my work seem so without purpose. I do not doubt your intentions nor your motives. I am merely concerned about your eventuality. And I am concerned about the eventuality of society. I'm concerned about the world's abandonment of God. Whoever that is. And of the nature that represents him. We head in a direction far from the Creator's intent. When did you start speaking on behalf of this Creator? So, you would have us all living in a cabin in the woods then? In our hearts, yes. In our spirits, yes. So we abandon progress? We abandon art and science and politics to hug trees? Nonsense. I would remind men what the simple woods mean to real life. What it means to live quietly and away from the chaos of the city. I live in the city, so does your family. And you have lost your sense of place in nature. That is why they cannot understand this cabin, or this pond, or this journal. Compared to most people in this world, you are indeed an oddity. Well, I beat my drum to those who drum to different footsteps. Hmm? My footsteps, they're in rhythm to those marching to their own drumbeat. What on earth are you mumbling about? What I am saying is I walk to the beat of a different drummer. Well, you certainly speak your own language. Hand me my journal, quickly. I walk to the beat. Is this not the height of arrogance? To record your own words for the sole purpose of quoting yourself? I hate quotations. Mr. Emerson, <laughs> this is called writing. You have made a profession of this same arrogance. This is in the brazen assumption that anyone anywhere would ever dare to quote Henry David Thoreau. Again, you mock me. I do nothing of the sort, but you are consumed with preserving your inanimate thought as though some kind of literary treasure. But your reams of pencil to paper are a hard read at best. There's, there's no structure, there's no poetry, there's no story, there's just the gush of what you feel. And isn't that exactly how we all think? You accuse my work of having no value. Well, as regards the marketplace, yes, I make that accusation. How on earth are you going to live? Who is going to publish a book about walking in the woods when the woods surround us? Who, for that matter, will buy the blessed thing? Nothing. You have written a book about nothing. Nothing indeed. You offend me again, old friend. I have created a pathway for a return to natural life for men trapped in the chaos of modern society. It is a map for our return to nature. Do maps not have a purpose in the marketplace? You build pathways where no roads are necessary. Where's the logic? Why put yourself through this? Again, you imply that I am an oddity. I would be more odd to sit down to write when I have not stood up to live. You're talking to your beans, Henry. <laughs> My beans? <laughs> Care for a bowl? Oh, yes, please. I'm famished. <laughs> Ah. Oh, wooden bowls. <laughs> I assume you carved those yourself. And the spoons. Poplar and maple. Fresh bread from my wife. Wonderful. Oh. Oh. Seriously, you need a girlfriend. You're wound up tighter than my grandfather's clock. Yes, but and I, I do not want to hear another word about your wood pile. <laughs> you and your wood pile. You do realize that I was not serious about hugging a tree. I wouldn't want to see you get overly attached. Don't be absurd <laughs> or insulting at my own table. Are you now devoid of a sense of humor? I read a sign of success is to laugh often and much. Now I am without success. No, you're without a woman. <laughs> I enjoy my solitude. Why not be alone with a soft, attentive woman? You need not marry the poor girl. Solitude without morality is chaos. I aim above morality. Be not simply good. Be good for something. <laughs> my dear, misguided friend, you do realize that it takes two people to be immoral. Now you accuse me of being immoral. Of course not, but I would like to see you have, you know, the potential. All right. All right. Do you want me to admit to my loneliness? I will. It is even agony at times. Is that what you wish to hear? I just want what's best for my friend. The nights are the longest, you know. 
so difficult. Each night I look behind the stars, hoping to find God behind them. I find no one. Each hour, every moment, it is excruciatingly quiet. The silence thunders to the point of actual pain. Well, then why? Why do this to yourself? Why this cabin in these woods, this pond, for two years? Two years and two months. And one day, yes, you have planted your feet here for a long time. If travel is the fool's paradise, you are indeed a wise man. And yet, I am at such a loss. You speak with such conviction regarding choices that cause you so much pain. I want to understand. I don't know how to answer that. For certain, something is pulling me here. Something calling me. Something in the soil. The earth. My brother, the world is full of soil and ponds and trees. You are consumed with a small raindrop in the midst of the floodwaters. And every flood begins with a single raindrop. Just as every drought begins with a ray of the morning sun. I see the coming drought, my friend. Because someday so much of this abundance will be gone. And by our own doing. How could that possibly be? Can you not see it? Can you not sense the loss? With every rail, every road, every bucket of mortar, we lose more and more of what we are as we search for what we will be. The horizon of society is changing, old friend. What was once a simple mountain and a sunrise is giving way to factories and rooftops. Can you not see it? I see this. You cut a tree, another grows in its place. You mow the field, the grass returns. Is it not possible that you envision a battle where there is no war? I see a battle where there is no victory. For people, for nature, for commerce. How utterly depressing and bleak. And on such a lovely morning at Walden Pond. So man can build a coach, but you fear that he's lost his will to use his feet. And what do your beans have to say about this impending industrial Armageddon? Men are becoming tools of their tools. You mock me yet again. Then I apologize. I actually agree with you, Henry. Well, that's why I bought these acres along Walden Pond. Yes, to save them from the Axemen. I share your dream, young Henry. Dream. More like nightmare. I do see a dream that invades my sleep every night. Oh, tell me that it breathes and has cherry lips, whatever it is. <laughs> I see this pond. I see these woods, but many years from now. Oh, a dream of the future. Tell me. People. A sea of people. They creep closer to these woods, stripping the land, destroying it, ripping the solitude asunder, the noise is endless. And then? I see houses. I see factories. And I see roads. Closer and closer the noise of it comes into these woods. I see them plowing the hillsides away, ripping these very woods apart. And then what happens? This pond. These woods suddenly saved. Saved? How? By the song of a great eagle. <laughs> Have you gone mad? <laughs> well, you asked, and I told you. You see the impending destruction of Walden Pond saved at the hand of a singing eagle. This foretold by a man who speaks to his vegetables. I should have known better. Oh, suddenly it's all making perfect sense. <laughs> Joshua, my friend. Hey, Mr. Henry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize you had company. <laughs> Mr. Emerson. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Greetings to you, sir. You're the writer. Just like Mr. Henry. Oh, not quite. I write books people will eventually read. Oh, Mr. Henry's a fine writer. <laughs> One day people all over the world will read his book. If he writes it, that is. <laughs> <laughs> I must tend to find my fireplace. Um... He talks to his broccoli. <laughs> yes, I, I am fully aware. <laughs> oh, I've heard him. He's quite a conversationalist. <laughs> uh, Mr. Joshua, do you live nearby? 
Oh, beyond the woods, I have a house just outside Concord. A family? Aye. A lovely wife I do and three children. And how did you come to know Henry? Oh, I work for Mr. Thorough in the pencil shop. I stack the lumber for the lathe, sweep the floors, look after Henry, whatever needs to be done. Yes, seems Henry needs a lot of looking after. Oh, no. He's really quite self-sufficient. He needs a lady friend, though. <laughs> Other than his wood pile, that is. <laughs> oh, he writes in that all the time, he does. Day and night. I would never admit it to his face, but really it is fascinating. He, he writes so fluidly and prolifically about his love for the earth and nature. He doesn't tolerate people all that much, but he does love his vegetation. <laughs> October is the month for painted leaves. We become more pensive in the twilight of the year. Hmm. Hmm. Go confidently in the direction of your dreams. Live the life you've imagined. As you simplify your life, the laws of the universe will be simpler. I once had a sparrow alight upon my shoulder while I was hoeing in a garden. And I felt more distinguished by that than by any crown I could have worn. That really is lovely. It is romantic mm -hmm. on many levels. <laughs> Every man looks at his woodpile with affection. I love to have mine before my window. <laughs> <laughs> He really needs a girlfriend. You're a good hobby. <laughs> this should help me survive the evening. <laughs> you two getting acquainted. Splendidly. <laughs> We've been uh, browsing through your journals. <laughs> Hope you don't mind, Henry. You truly are a gifted writer. I suppose not. It's all just simple notes. Nothing is edited, of course. No, it reads well. Much better than I assumed. Yeah, that's a lovely fire. <laughs> Mr. Joshua, I have enjoyed our visit. Henry, I must be home to my wife. It's good of you to come by, really. As your friend, you know I'm worried about you, and I do wish you well. Just don't be disappointed if others who someday read you are unavailable to your intent. I do appreciate your counsel, old friend, but not even I am completely sure of my intent. Well, I must be off. My wife awaits. Perhaps after a few years in this cabin, you too will miss the sound of another heartbeat. Perhaps my sister. She loves broccoli. <laughs> I could arrange an introduction. I don't think there is a woman alive who could tolerate or even begin to understand this. Oh, well, then no doubt it would be impolite to even ask. So there it is then. You are a man destined to live his life alone in these woods. Not my life. Not even one week more. Mr. Henry. All this talk of the relevancy of my work. <laughs> I never intended on living out my days here anyway. Well, I detect a change in the wind. I have decided it is time. I shall prepare to gather my things and leave this cabin. Tomorrow, I am leaving Walden Pond. Good morning, Mr. Henry. Joshua, drinking the wine at nature's morning table, I see. I'm sorry, Mr. Henry. <laughs> I, 
I don't drink. Not this early. Hey, maybe later at the pub. Never mind. So why the visit so early in the day? I love the way you play the flute. Music. It is the true gauge that measures the currents of our thoughts. The very undertow of our life's stream. You cannot hear music and noise at the same time. Speaking of noise, why are you here? Well, you, you said you were leaving the woods. I've come to help shutter the cabin. So, you've come to fetch the splendor of my life at Walden Pond and carry me back to the city. Y your father sends his regards. Work's been busy at the pencil shop. I think he misses you. I'm sure he misses my work. A father's pride and all. Don't you miss your family? Living all the way out here and alone. At times. Yet my days here are spent by the same tick of the clock as anywhere else. I rise in the morning and rest under the same sunset as any man. Or any king. Well, I, I suppose it's what you do with the in-between times that makes sex man apart. Or who you do it with. <laughs> or not. And yet I am no different. I share the same spirit. I have the same connection to natural earth as anyone. You know, for a man who prides himself on being the same, you certainly go out of your way to be different. My contradiction to human nature is my balance with human nature. You're the only man I know who talks to his broccoli. Ooh! Ah. Um. <laughs> Miss Rachel, you've come. <laughs> I've come as asked by Mr. Thorough. My father sent you. Uh, actually, that, that was my doing. Um, <laughs> I thought we could help prepare your return to the city. There. That was easy. <laughs> this, is, this is nonsense. Put my things back down. I'm not ready to up and leave just yet anyway. But, but what should I tell your father? I have more study and thought. I must spend my time considering more of this earth, these woods. Stay, if you must. I will be off for a walk. It is pleasant to walk over the bed of these fresh, crisp and rustling leaves. How beautifully they go to their graves. What a completely peculiar man. He is rather odd at times. I've never met a man so thoroughly rude. Oh, Mr. Henry isn't rude. He's just a drummer who beats a drum he doesn't have. <laughs> Differently than everybody else. And what of this place? This is his home? It is. <laughs> It is rudimentary and plain. Hey, simple, maybe, is a word. All intelligence awakes with the morning. Poetry and art and the fairest and most memorable actions of all men come from such an hour. That is lovely. We are, for the most part, more lonely when among men than when we stay in our chambers. A man thinking or working is always alone. <clears throat> hmm. I love to be alone. I never found the companion that was so companionable as solitude. Such rubbish! And what of life? Of family? Is this man devoid of love? Oh, only for people. I, I mean, he loves his birds and trees and such. A man cannot have a family by loving only trees. I wouldn't underestimate Mr. Henry. And what of this? I derive no pleasure from talking with a young woman simply because she has regular features. Has his living alone in these woods made him go daft? Or was he in such a state to begin with? Miss Rachel, he's really a very kind man. He has a, a, a deep heart, a deep spirit, he does. Well, I'm not one to gossip, nor do I listen to such nonsense. But I have heard your Mr. Thorough refuses the company of suitors. 
women suitors. He just doesn't like people, is all. Of all persuasions. What does this man of solitude do for companionship, then? Who does um, this man with such deep feelings uh, express himself to? Here now, uh, Mr. Emery is very particular about how his vegetables are handled. Oh. Oh. oh, well, I've come to speak with Henry. Oh, he's left. He's uh, gone down the woods with his flute and his notebook. And who is this? Uh, Rachel Stewart's. Miss Rachel Stewart's from Mr. Thorough's shop. Do I dare ask if you are a friend of Henry's? Not yet. <laughs> we just met this morning, and then he left. You speak as though this disturbs you. I came all the way into these woods to assist, and the man barely greeted me. Oh, he was just being normal. He was just being Henry. Are you not under Mr. Thorough's employ? Well, then you have no valid complaint. A coin for your mood. <laughs> Excuse me, sir. I do not sell my offense so easily. Oh, my goodness! Such spirit! <laughs> she has a high-priced mood, obviously. Tell me, what was Henry's reaction to the young woman? Oh, he left. Splendid! He likes her! <laughs> <laughs> he did it. Miss Rachel's the first breeding thing he's liked in years. <laughs> Perhaps so. Yes. I must speak with Henry. Which direction did he go? Oh, oh down to the pond. Uh, follow the sound of the flute. And the non-banging drum. <laughs> Do not think that you have companions. Know instead that you are alone in the world. Poor Mr. Henry. <laughs> hey, I thought you'd left the town. I have a job to do. So, I'll do exactly as instructed by my employer. I certainly don't need any man's coin to fulfill my obligation. He didn't mean anything by it, really. Why do men assume their thoughts transcend other people's feelings? Men work differently. A man executes his thoughts unencumbered by emotion. And a woman will express her feelings freely. Often without thinking. So, I'm wrong for being angry? No, you're not being wrong because it was an honest reaction. You're only wrong for thinking you had reason to. I completely disagree. What do you honestly find that disagreement with? And why must you put me to the test? You cannot convince me the spread of cities does not matter. Why object to progress as though it's a bad thing? Progress without balance is a bad thing. Progress by its very nature causes imbalance. To deny imbalance denies progress. Only man struggles with this imbalance. It is against nature. When a beaver builds a dam, it does not harm the stream. When a bird builds a nest, it causes no injury to the forest. Beavers and birds exist. Within the boundaries created for them, they do not cause progress. Only man has the intellect by nature to cause progress. How can you possibly deny man's destructive role in nature? His lack of love for this earth. To leave it unchecked will eventually lead to the destruction of man. And how can you deny that destruction is an essential part of creation? Oh, nonsense! Is this emotion or expressive male thought? <laughs> Look at your own life, Henry. Me! <laughs> I destroy nothing, and do not even begin to imply the natural gleaning of the earth as destruction. Did you or did you not come to these woods and this pond to study the value of nature and your place in it? I did. And did you not destroy a small plot of these very woods to build this cabin so you would have a place to stay while in nature? It is not the same. It's exactly the same. My cabin is not comparable to the spread of a city. It's merely the first building. There's no difference. Read my work. I document the difference clearly. Your father cuts down trees to make pencils that you use to write how much you love the trees. Again, my redundant friend, it's part of the natural gleaning of the earth. That is called progress. A few short years ago, we wrote with charcoal and quill pens. Not a single oak would fall. Now we cut down trees to make pencils and employ your family. Progress. So I shall use the tools of progress to expose the sin of progress. 
then you, sir, are a hypocrite. I beg your pardon. She speaks from emotion, Mr. Henry. There was no thought involved. You sounded very thoughtful to me. Explain yourself. You, sir, are a blind hypocrite. <laughs> what a delightful woman. <laughs> You write so eloquently about the emotion of your place in nature, but you refuse to express the emotions you need to understand what nature is for. You write of the value of nature, when all the while you disobey your natural needs, rendering your place on Earth as no value at all. It is as though you were never here. What? Mr. Thorough? Let me introduce you to a living, breathing woman with a point of view. Don't be frightened, Mr. Henry. You read my essay on civil disobedience. I did, at your father's pencil shop. And you've read through my notebooks. I have. Good God, a customer. <laughs> and yet you conclude he is a hypocrite. Well, when skating over thin ice, my dear, your safety is in your speed. I should quickly clarify myself. You are a hypocrite. But not a fool. Not a fool. I'm suddenly to feel complimented? I didn't find your hypocrisy without wisdom. Although you're blind to your role in destruction, you are not wrong about a man's imbalance. Well, there you have it. My life's work validated by my father's cleaning woman. This idea of balance may be not altogether inappropriate. Perhaps the idea of balance can bring perspective to this argument. In what way? It means, perhaps, that a man destroys a little by his nature. He should just not destroy too much. Exactly. Well said. And the cities, therefore, are the too much that causes this imbalance. Cities are part of the natural progress of man. Like an ocean wave. The wave moves onward, but the water of which it is composed does not. Again, natural. The greater the destruction, the greater the progress. There is nothing natural about it. Why do you equate destruction with progress? Here, you garden these. Yes. And you harvest them. Yes. And you destroy them by pulling them. You destroy them by cooking them. Is not a farm nothing more than a small city? A farm in itself does not decimate the land. No more so than a city. Factories. Plows. Smokestacks. Fireplaces and chimneys. Garbage. Manure and leftovers. Noise. Children. Confusion. Marriage. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Oh dear, I sense imbalance. Now that was not that meant was to meant That was meant exactly as spoken. All this talk of imbalance, as though it was balanced men speaking. Now we are not balanced. Love for the earth, without loving the life this earth provides, is unbalanced. And it renders you irrelevant. Not bad for a cleaning lady. My employee does not alter my thoughts, sir. And your thoughts do not alter my experience. Your experience has been to isolate yourself in a cabin so far from real life that you can only write the reflection of what true life has to offer. True life is no more reflected by society than your image in the waters of Walden Pond. Are not the stars reflecting on the pond at night actually the stars? You are so lost in the image of the stars, you do not see society creeping up to take the pond away. Where are your stars then? Where is your reflection of real life once the pond is gone? Your life is no more real than a dying fish left behind on a dry waterbed. At least the fish didn't die alone in a cabin talking to its vegetables. Many people go fishing all their lives without knowing it's not fish thereafter. What exactly irritates you so about me, madam? Because I cannot for the life of me understand why you bother to come to a cabin and write about a life you're not living. To the contrary, I have found the essence of life in its simplicity. You confuse isolation with simplicity. And you, my dear woman, confuse isolation with simply not wanting to be with you. I feel the temperature's dropped in this cabin. I think I'll light the candle. Oh, 
I apologize if my honesty left an inappropriate or dishonorable impression. I didn't come to these woods to squalor in my solitude as if it is some lonely crown. And I didn't want to waste two years and two months of a fleeting life in an empty fog with no purpose. And I didn't come here simply to write. I came to these woods because I wished to live deliberately. To strip life down to its barest essentials. And see if there wasn't something life couldn't teach me. And not when I came to die discover that I had not lived at all. I came to Walden Pond to discover my life. Not abandon it. And only then to write what I truly, passionately believed. To write what I truly lived so that others, my friends, could also live simply and honestly. My friend, the world is yet simple. Your cries of simplicity fall on deaf ears. Even so, the rumbling of the coming industrial storm grows louder. The thunder of coming change will not be felt along the shores of Walden Pond alone. It will be global. England. France, Germany, beyond. The forests will be replaced with factories. The woods plowed under, covered over with warehouses. Perhaps the clouds beyond the distant lightning are not clouds at all, but oceans of smoke from the cities. I, I don't see it when, you know, everything around you looks just fine. Well, the woods by Walden Pond look particularly lovely this September. I don't hear no thunder. I don't see no lightning. And the only rumbling I hear is from my tummy with no supper. I didn't mean to be rude or accuse, but to speak honestly, as you say, it takes two to speak truth, one to speak, and another to listen, and I have listened. Then so shall I. Then we're friends then? Oh, let's hug! Look, I don't need a hug. I need relief from this incessant arguing. It's not arguing, Henry. It's a test of your convictions, a test of your passions. Test? Why? Because to be great is to be misunderstood, and I believe that you have done a great thing. So of course, I agree with you, Henry. That's why I bought these acres of land along Walden Pond. That's why I gladly offered you this spot here in the woods. But do you believe this yourself? Do you believe in your heart the value of what you have done? Hear me, my friend. Once you leave this place, everything you believe in will be ripped apart and judged by men of smaller minds. Or held in their highest esteem. I don't need their approval. No, whatever you do, you will need courage, because whatever course you decide upon, there will always be someone of lesser will to tell you you're wrong. Or fools who will tempt you to believe that your critics are right. And no one ever erected a statue in honor of a critic. And I would argue your degree of greatness will be measured by the extent that you are rejected. For remember Socrates or Luther, Galileo, every pure and wise spirit that ever walked this earth confused everyone around him. So my hypocrisy has turned into confusion, and in turn my future and my works will be understood by no one? And what of my life? At this cabin, at this pond, have I indeed wasted two years Two months and two days of my life. To be great is to be misunderstood. So, hit your wagon to a star, my boy. What you write, what you believe, and the road your passions have traveled will be understood someday. Then you can see it. You can feel it, too. Yes, I can. Some can. Most will not. The majority will ignore it in favor of their material comfort. But 
if we will pause for a moment, if we will bend down on a humble knee and truly gaze at the brilliance of the tiniest life in our hands, we can use what you have written as a magnifying glass to peer deep into the simplest of life's beauties. In my heart, I believe the world will one day recognize this of you, Henry. But not now. Not now, that's why I say someday. Your writing will have purpose and impact someday. And if this someday occurs within a moment well beyond my lifetime, what of my words? What of my writings and journals? Rest these words regarding your love and respect for this earth in the care of those who love and respect you. Let your works rest in the protection of your friends who believe in you. <laughs> the most striking part of any day is to encounter a mind that startles us. And what you have done, what you are writing, will startle many for generations to come. Much is published, but so little printed. An honest book is the noblest work of man. Unfortunately, I'm imprisoned by the narrowness of my experience. So be it. It is done, then. To my house, all, for supper and celebration. Uh, here, um, my notebook and my flute. <laughs> One pause for reflection, and then I'll follow. <laughs> Oh, my dear Henry, in the end, always the last. And always alone. beauty of the last hour of the day. I do believe this earth is the mother of all creatures. As surely as the sunset shall translate me into the ethereal world, as surely as the last strain of music which falls on my ear shall make age be forgotten. So surely my friend shall ever be my friend and reflect a ray of God to me. Walden Pond isn't magic, but what happened there obviously is. Henry David Thoreau changed the literary world and became the forefather of the environmental movement because of what he wrote there, because of his passion, because of his spirit. And we can learn a lot from that. One of the things I think we should learn is not to do this. 
Our hometowns are too important. Our home communities are too important. We live in a world that is not like Henry David Thoreau's, that's for sure. We travel at cyber speeds now. Our multimedia world comes at us with billions of bits of information all the time. It's hard to simplify. So what can we do? Years ago in Europe, there was a saying that if everybody in the world simply took care of their own homes, you wouldn't have to worry about the world anymore. In the 1960s, that became a bumper sticker. Think globally, act locally. You know, it works. It's very, very true. Look within the reach of your own grasp. What can you do in your backyard, in your hometown? Can you clean up a stream? Can you clean up a sidewalk? How about your schoolyard? What can you do in your community? Don't worry about the world. Worry about your hometown. One of the things that we can do is maybe change the kinds of bulbs we have in our home. We can do things like eat better. You know, a healthy person likes the clean surroundings. The bottom line is this. Henry David Thoreau encouraged us to care deeply about what nature has to give us. Walden Pond is a good example, but this isn't Walden Pond. This is a creek near my hometown in Lexington, Kentucky. There's Walden Ponds all over the world. There's little cabins in our heart that all of us can live in, whether you're in a third floor condo or in a farmhouse or Arizona or Canada or Europe or New Jersey, wherever you are, caring about your hometown. That's the essence of what Henry David Thoreau wrote. So take a walk in the woods, go for a stroll with your family, take a deep breath and relax from this fast paced world because ultimately our life is still very simple and very beautiful. My name is Michael Jonathan. I am a folk singer. I am a tree hugger. And I hope you enjoyed the play, Walden, The Ballad of Thoreau.